Thanks for coming uh, at this late time in the semester. Uh, and this will be the last of our philosophy colloquia series uh, lecture. And it's organized together with religious studies, particularly Todd Lewis, and sponsored by uh, the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm actually introducing and welcoming Georges Dreyfus, who is a professor of religion at Williams College to Holy Cross. Uh, he is the author of numerous articles on Buddhistic philosophy and uh, philosophy of mind, and also two books, Recognizing Reality, Dhammakitri's Philosophy and its Tibetan Interpretations, and then also the sounds of two hands clapping the education of a Tibetan Buddhist monk. Uh, and that's a book that I uh, read while on the plane to India where I was getting involved somewhat accidentally teaching philosophy of science to Buddhist monks. And it was the book that kind of explained the educational system uh, within Buddhist monasteries. And so it gave me a first inkling and some familiarity to what was uh, waiting for me. And I wasn't so sure uh, that I signed up for that, but it was very interesting. And uh, not to forget to mention, uh, Professor Dreyfus is himself, or was himself, a Buddhist monk uh, who studied uh, for a long time in the monastery of the uh, Dalai Lama in Dharamsala in India. Uh, when we normally decide to go to college, uh, at the time it was the 70s, uh, he decided to find himself and travel to India through Iran, Turkey, and Pakistan something you probably wouldn't survive if you attempted to do it nowadays. Uh, but he ended up in the monastery of the Dalai Lama and became the first Western Geishi uh, that is equivalent to a PhD in Buddhistic studies. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to his illuminations about uh, Buddhistic debates and inquiries, and without further ado, Professor Dreyfus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, to see old friends and new faces. So thank you for coming. Uh, I want to talk about the topic which is dear to me, which is the topic of my book, uh, The Sound of Two Hands Clapping. And when I wrote this book, I wanted to write a book about the Tibetan monastic education that I had myself undergone. And the problem was to find a category that would adequately uh, communicate what kind of education that education was. And I chose, uh, with some reluctance, the term scholasticism, because that term had such a pejorative connotation in modern Western uh, discourse, at least most of it. If you say this is scholastic, it's not exactly high praise. And yet I found that this is actually uh, the term which is uh, quite very adequate to describe this tradition, and also a term that needs to be properly understood, and that's what I am going to do in this talk. So I'm going to talk about Tibetan education as a scholastic education and try to un unpack what this idea of scholasticism means. So... Uh, I, I found uh, some remark by a scholar called Mac, George Mactisi uh, quite illuminating, and that I found really is, was a good way to start to understand 
what it is that I had, what kind, the kind of education I had undergone. And Maktisi talks about uh, scholasticism consisting of intellectual tools or intellectual technologies and a spirit. And it's these two things together that uh, for him constitute the category scholasticism. So the spirit is uh, the combination of authority and inquiry. And that's what really marks scholasticism as an intellectual tradition for Maktisi, but I, I, I will appropriate his idea, mark it off from other intellectual traditions. Uh, it is this combination, I call it the dialectic combination between authority, the authority of the tradition, and inquiry. What I mean is that uh, in a scholastic tradition, in a way, the truth of the tradition is given by the tradition. That's the authority part. Now, to a modernist, to a modern even ear, that sounds like, okay, the truth is pre-given, therefore we just need to repeat, and that confirms this kind of usual stereotype about scholasticism, which is that it's just rote repetition, it has no creativity, and so on. And, and so what is important to understand is that scholasticism is not just, is not repetition. It is uh, appropriation of the tradition. Now the tradition, uh, as I will argue, is obviously impose limits to interpretation. But what is important to understand is that uh, for the kind of rich religious tradition that I am that uh, Maktis is talking about and I am talking about, uh, the truth is not just the simple repetition of some kind of points that are to be listed and repeated and learned by heart and repeated. To uh, become a scholar in the tradition entails that one is able to appropriate for oneself the content of that tradition. And so authority and inquiry work together at the same time that they are in tension with each other. Because if you really do inquiry, you are going to kind of cross certain borders. And yet, at the end, the tradition is usually able to bring back people at the place they want them to be. And so it's this why I, I call it dialectical combination, because there is both a, a complementarity between authority and inquiry, because without inquiry, there is no appropriation of the tradition. There is just mere repetition of the, the words, and that's not how you uh, keep a rich scholarly tradition going. So there is a complementarity between authority and uh, inquiry, but there is also a tension, because if you inquire, you are going to uh, cross certain boundary that the tradition may not want you to cross. And that's what Maktisi called the spirit of scholasticism, this combination of authority and tradition. Okay, so that's a spirit. What I want to talk uh, in greater detail is the, the intellectual technologies that the tradition deploy in order to uh, further this project of appropriating, of combining author the tradition and inquiry. And in the Tibetan context, I decided I would settle on three uh, intellectual tools or technologies, and I'm going to talk briefly about the first two, and then uh, more in detail about the third, which is debate. So the first of this intellectual technology, I apologize, I don't have, I didn't have time to make a PowerPoint. 
So if you want to take notes, I'm, I will try to lay out the divisions pretty clearly. Uh, so the, the first is memorization. That's a really important tool of the scholastic tradition, at least of the Tibetan scholastic tradition, for uh, at least two reasons. One is that memorization is the basis for entering a monastery. Most, now, in Tibet, not all monasteries were very regarding about who would become monk and so on, but in the ones who had, had slightly higher standard, they, they all asked the, the monks to memorize the basic rituals of the monastery. And so memorization is a basic part of a Tibetan monastic education. And so if you go to Tibetan monastery, you may think, oh, wonderful, peaceful, and so on. No, every, uh, both morning and evening, the kids are screaming like, wah, 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 like this. I call them island of noise rather than islands of peace. It's very noisy and because everybody or all the kids are memorizing. Then there is a second role for, um, for uh, memorization, which is memorization of the basic text. And I'm going to talk about some of these texts when I talk about commentary. So... The Tibetan curriculum is based on a certain Indian text, and so uh, when you study, you have to memorize this text, and then uh, you're going to read commentary, and your teacher is going to explain to you this text. So you have written commentary and oral commentary, but uh, the teacher will ask you to memorize the text. When I was, uh, I asked one teacher to teach me the Mula Madhyamika Karika, which is the most important philosophical text in Tibetan tradition, Madhyamika text. Uh, my teacher told me, okay, just memorize the text and then come back. And then I memorized about 17 chapters of the 25, and then he said, okay, that's good enough, we can start. So this is basically uh, what... Now, this is... Memorizing the basic text is the minimum when one does. As a Westerner, this is basically what they asked me to do. Because, you know, as a Westerner, you, you know, it's a bit harder to memorize in Tibetan. And so they thought, okay, we'll give you a special pass and we'll make you memorize only the basic texts. And then, uh, but Tibet, my Tibetan friends would memorize quite a bit more would memorize entire commentaries. And so some people memorize a lot. I, I think the, sometimes they go a bit too far because I don't think memorizing a lot is all that useful. But I do think that the art of memorization is really a really great training because it's a training in attention. Uh, because, and this is, I think, especially relevant to nowadays where our attention is grabbed by so many electronic devices. And that's terrible for developing attention because one develops attention by controlling the focus of one's mind. And so with electronic device, you learn exactly the opposite habit, which is to just let your mind go wherever it's the most exciting. But uh, when you have to memorize, you cannot do that. It's really boring, but precisely because it is boring, you learn how to control and fine-tune your attention. So it's a really great training, uh, uh, though I think some people overdo it. And so this is uh, uh, the training in memorization. So memorization is the first tool I wanted to talk about. Second is commentary, which I have already touched upon, and that's a very important category, obviously, in any religious tradition. It is particularly important in a scholastic tradition, or at least in the Tibetan scholastic tradition, because the texts that are the basis of this education are not just classics, but they really constitute the curriculum. So, when you study Madhyamika, 
you study Nagarjuna or you study Chandrakirti. And there is no learning Madhyamika outside of studying these texts. So these texts are not just classic, you know, Paradise Lost and Principia Mathematica and so on. You can do English literature without having read, I guess, uh, Paradise Lost, but you cannot do Madhyamika without having read Mad uh, Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti. And so uh, the texts are kind of formative and constitutive of the curriculum of the tradition. With, it's not like you do Madhyamika in a textbook and then you read the basic text on the side. No, it's really the basic text which form the curriculum. And so the basic texts are all important Indian text. Uh, they're called Shastras. They are written according to what I would call the Brahmanical Sutra method. And it's kind of confusing because the word Sutra in Buddhist means something different than uh, in the Brahmanical tradition. In the Brahmanical tradition, a Sutra is an aphoristic text that uh, collects, puts together all the main points from a particular tradition. So the Brahma Sutra kind of summarized the Upanishad, the Yoga Sutra summarized the yogic tradition, and so on, right? And so the Buddhist Shastra are the Buddhist equivalent of this uh, Brahmanical Sutra. They are aphoristic texts that summarize the main points of a particular bod larger body of canonical texts, like, for example, the Mula Madhyamika Karika is supposed to summarize, sorry, the teaching of the Prajnaparamita Sutras. The Abhisamalankara is supposed to summarize the teaching, the other part of the Prajnaparamita Sutra, but other Mayana Sutra as well, all summarizing the main point about uh, the Mahayana path, the practice. Then the Abhidharma Kosha summarized the entire, uh, the seven treaties of the Abhidharma, the can canonical material, and so on. So what you do in this education is not to go to these basic texts, the sutras, Buddhist sutras, right, of the Vinaya, for example, but what you do is you, you learn this uh, you, you really study these uh, shastras. You memorize them, and then you, re you read commentaries, and also very important, most important, is the commentary that your teacher gives you. And sometimes it's you are in a class with many people, uh, sometimes you are on your own with your teacher, but this is one very important part of the Tibetan monastic education is going through this basic shastra in the light of Indian and Tibetan commentaries. Okay, so <coughs> uh, this is a very important uh, characteristic of Tibetan uh, scholastic tradition. It's also very important because this is how Tibetans do think about, I mean Tibetan, Tibetan monastic, Tibetan monastic think about. Uh, when they do philosophy, they tend to think either through Nagarjuna or through Dharmakirti, and their thinking is completely shaped by this basic text that uh, they have uh, uh, studied. And for them to do philosophy, in a way, is to comment on this different text. And so that's the entire, it's, it's kind of an entire style of a tradition, and, and that gives it uh, a strong mooring in the tradition, at the same time that it's kind of a limit because obviously not every topic is necessarily touched in this important text. And so that tells you already how, uh, how scholasticism is different from uh, a modern intellectual tradition, right? which is in principle 
let me emphasize in principle, open to uh, a whole range of topics. Here the topics are kind of predetermined by the basic text that are the basis for the education. Okay, so as you can see, commentary uh, is, in a way, uh, is a way for the tradition to impart its content, right? And so it's, it's in a way on the side of the authority uh, part of the dialectic. Now, uh, you may wonder uh, where does uh, the inquiry come? And in various scholastic tradition, uh, this is done differently, but in Tibetan uh, scholasticism, I think it's clear that what is uh, mostly uh, uh, the site of inquiry is debate. So this is the third of these intellectual tools or intellectual technology I want to talk about. So we have the spirit, which is the complementarity of authority and inquiry, and we have the intellectual tools, which are memorization, commentary, and debate. So let's talk about debate. And that's, uh, maybe I will show you uh, a little bit uh, uh, how Tibetans do it. This is not proper to Tibetans. Uh, you find debates in yeshiva, you find debates in, uh, Ira in Iranian Shia uh, madrasas, and so on. So you find debate in a number, and obviously in uh, medieval Europe, in a uh, European university like Paris, you had a lot of debates. So this is not proper to uh, Tibetans, but Tibetans have carried really to uh, a, a, an interesting So it's ready to go. So let me show you what debate look like. Can we go? Okay. So this is a debating practice that Tibetan monks do every day for often several hours. And I'm going obviously to explain to you uh, w what it is that they do with this gesture and so on. So you see that they, they are a pair. One person is sitting down. That's what I go, will call the responder, the defendant. And then the, uh, the uh, person who is standing is the one who disputes him. So uh, I refer you to your... Uh, Hand out under letter A, participant is the defender and the questioner. Okay, let Okay, so what's going on? What's going on is a particular form of debate that Tibetans have uh, developed. And I'm going to explain you the, the logic, how that debate is structured. What is important to understand is that the basic tool of that debate is not a probative argument, what you would call a syllogism but is a very different uh, logical tool, which is called the statement of consequence. Now, it's going to look to you like a syllogism. It has a form. It follows that A is B because of C. And you think, well, that looks like something like a syllogism, right? But it's not. <laughs> and the difference is that in a syllogism, or let's call it probative argument, because the Indian syllogism are really not really a syllogism in the Aristotelian sense of the word, but they are probative argument, meaning argument that seeks to 
prove something, to establish something. A is B because it's C, right? Now, here it looks like it follows that A is B because of C. It's like, well, yeah, that's what it is. No, it's not. Not at all. What is this statement is a statement of consequence which is in which the questioner, the, pro the person who is standing and debating, is put, using these statements to unfurl the consequences of the positions of the guy who is sitting down, the defendant. So, in a statement of consequence, that, this, that statement implies no commitment on the part of the person who makes this statement. Whereas in a probative argument, if I say A is B because of C, I am committed to the truth that A is C and whatever is C is B, therefore A is B. If I'm not committed, at least in Indian logic, you cannot put a, a statement like that. The Tibetan dialectical tool that you see there is not of that kind. It is what's called a prasanga, telgur in Tibetan, and it is a statement in which you just draw out the logical consequences from the uh, positions of the defendant, the poor guy who is sitting down. Okay? So, obviously, that statement of consequence follows from certain statement made by the defendant, right? Because if there is no starting point, you cannot unfurl any consequences, right? So the debate always starts by asking, usually it starts by uh, using a quote from one of his texts that I have talked about previously, and then asking the defendant to uh, explain that quote, and then probably asking the defendant a couple of, to explain, to define a couple of terms. Okay? And then the task of the questioner is to unfurl the consequences from the statement made by the defendant so as to bring the defendant to contradict himself. That's how Tibetan debate proceeds. So it's really different from Indian debates. Indian debates, as far as we know, uh, reading the Nyaya stuff and reading uh, some uh, Sakya Pandita uh, explanation about the debate, the Indian debate was a debate focused mostly on probative argument. Here's my thesis, here's the reason why I'm defending this thesis, and then the person who is questioning is going to take, try to take apart the basic reason, the basic reasoning, which is a probative argument, right? And this is why in Indian logic, you have a lot of formal uh, criteria about what constitutes a proper argument and what are the points of defeat and so on. Tibetan debates are very different. They don't seek to prove anything. They seek to oblige the defendant, the guy who is sitting down, to contradict himself. Okay? So you start to see how it's going to work, right? So how do you do it? Well, you do it because it, it's actually complicated and it requires about a year of training to just master this system. So here's the system. So the basic form of the statement is it follows that A is B because of C. You have three answers which are available. I accept the consequence. 
the reason of your consequence is not established, meaning uh, A is not C. And then the third is literally there is no pervasion, there is no entailment between B and C. Now, whether A is B or whether C, uh, C entails B is not a question of what is true in the world. It is only a question of what the defendant has committed himself to. Right? That's why this, state, this statement of consequence is a really strange logical animal because you think it's about, well, whether it's true or not. No, it's not whether it's true, it's whether it holds according to the view of the defendant, right? And I give you an example about uh, uh, the definition of impermanence, that which is momentary, that gives an entailment between impermanence and momentariness, right? Because momentariness being the definition, the defining characteristic of uh, impermanence, it Whatever is impermanent is momentary as well. So that entailment allows you to formulate a statement of consequence of the uh, of the the kind. Uh, like the mountains is momentary because it's impermanent, right? And then you're going to ask the person, what does it mean to be momentary? Meaning to be just, exist only for a moment, right? And you're going to ask the person whether a moment is a short moment or a long moment. And this is how you're going to try to push the person towards contradiction. So let's assume that the person uh, uh, gives uh, the answer that uh, momentary means short moment, then you would say it follows, follows, follows that the mountain exists only for a short moment because it is momentary, right? So, <laughs> what you're trying to do here is push the person toward making an absurd statement. The guy down, down, who is sitting down is going to try to resist that. And resisting that, he has to use one of the three answers. And this is how you, the debate is going to proceed. The defendant, the questioner, is going to unfurl these statements of consequences. And the defendant is going to try to give the answers that are going to get him out of having to contradict himself. So that's how the debate is going to work. As you see, this is a kind of complicated logical machinery uh, which takes quite a while to master because it's hard to put one's mind into thinking exclusively about these three possible answers, but actually these three possible answers cover everything that you can say, provided that the statement is well formulated. There is, if the statement is not well formulated, the defendant can always say, no, your statement is poorly formulated. If I ask you, did you bring back the book that you stole from the library? There is no good answer to a statement like that, right? If you say yes, uh, it means you stole the, the, the book. If you say no, it means you kept the book that you stole, right? So you can, uh, as a defendant, you can always say your uh, statement of consequence is poorly formulated. But then you have to explain why. For example, in this case, the presupposition is faulty, right? 
but if you cannot claim that the statement is, is, is faulty, you have to give the three answers. And that's how the debate is going to proceed. The defendant is going to give these answers, and the questioner is going to try to push the questioner to contradict himself. In this case, the contradiction is going to come when the defendant will have to agree that momentary doesn't mean existing only for a short moment. At that point, you go, Tsa! you're finished, you contradicted yourself. Then you, the debate is not necessarily finished. You might say, OK, then what does it mean? Then the guy will say, well, it means existing for a long moment. And so you're going to try to push the person towards contradicting again, right? And so uh, if you're really successful in your debate as a questioner, you will totally destroy the person because the person will get to a point where literally he cannot give any answer because number issue number one is blocked, issue number two is blocked, and that's a very painful uh, place to be. Obviously, the goal of the defendant is to uh, can can we can you the goal of the defendant is to not to go there, right? And that's how the debate works. So debates can be yeah, we we go to the no the other one the the last one, and we go down. To Okay. So it gets pretty animated. <laughs> Buddhist monks, right? You think very peaceful and so on. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm trying to get to... No, this is debate is where the fun is. <laughs> oh, I don't, and I cannot hear. Yeah, but it's it's the same kind of uh, logical structure. <coughs> so what you saw is this movement. The questioner puts a statement of consequence like this, right? And then. Uh, the person who is down, who is sitting down, is giving one of the three answers. And the debate proceeds like that. As you can see, it's extremely animated. It's real fun. And so uh, when they were going, oh, chair, 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 what they were saying is, give an answer, give an answer. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, they will make jokes. The guy is like thinking and they... And they, they will say, oh, are you in meditation? Oh, wonderful, and make fun of him, and so on. And then, chair, chair, chair. Now, you can imagine, this was a small group, this is a demonstration. 
They, by the way, when they debate in the month, they actually don't wear the yellow robe. Uh, this is for demonstration. They really only wear the, 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 the sand, the red robe. Uh, when they debate, uh, when you debate in a big assem assembly, so you, you're sitting down like one or two person, and then there might be a few tens of people around him, there might be hundreds, there might be thousands, and so uh, everybody is against you. You are the defendant. Now, a person starts a debate, but if that person fades, or if that uh, Another person can come, as in this example where there were three people uh, kind of fighting with each other to, to make a point. And then when, for example, they say, chair, 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 like the entire assembly goes together, chair, chair, chair. So, you know, unless you're pretty sturdy, it's kind of a, a little bit unsettling. And then uh, when they, you have contradicting yourself, they go, oh, tsa, tsa, and the entire assembly, it might be a few thousand people, go together, tsa, tsa. So that's monastic fun, scholastic fun. So this is how uh, I would say the inquiry part of the education is really prominent because that's a really very peculiar form of debate. Because what is being sought is to find what is wrong with the statement, right? And that's a really great way to educate the mind. Because usually when we're faced by a statement, we tend to be taken by the statement and not really be able to take apart what is implied and entailed by the statement, right? And so, what you're obliged to do every day for at least two, three hours, when you debate, if you're the debater, you are obliged to f take apart the different points that you're studying. Because if you don't take them apart, there is no contradiction. The person will just answer, and your debate will just collapse. So what you really develop is the ability to see uh, where the contradictions, the possible contradictions are, right? To locate what's questionable in the various statements that are being made. And so that's a great way to inquire because obviously uh, when you have a point of doctrine like uh, the definition of impermanence is momentariness, Okay, that's what uh, Dharma Kirti says, so it must be right. But let's unpack that. Let's think about what momentariness means. Does it mean to exist for a short moment? Does it mean to exist for a longer moment? What does it mean, right? And so this is the training that you get uh, every day that you uh, study, every day you debate, two by two, as we saw in this form, and then sometime in group, sometimes your classmate, like your cohort, maybe 10, 20 people, and sometimes the entire monastery or several monasteries together. So that's what I think uh, the, what I would call the inquiry part of the education is, because unless you're good at taking statements apart, you're not going to be very good at debate. And then the person who is defending is, has to uh, understand where the questioner is going and find a way to escape his trap, right? And that's a different kind of exercise. Uh, that's an exercise more into, uh, it's more an exercise in uh, being able to think about how to interpret various terms uh, without being boxed in by a particular interpretation. Because if you're boxed in, you can be sure that the opponent, if he's good enough, is going to be able to take you apart. So you must know where the opponent is, is going, and you must be able to give interpretation that are going to hold against 
his debate. So that gives you an idea of how uh, monastic uh, education functions. So debates, I would call them dialectical practices because they are aimed at winning, but they are, uh, they, they are conversation, they are agonistic conversation, but they're also tightly regulated conversation because everything has to fit into this format of it follows that A is B because of C and you have three answer, I accept, the reason is not established or there is no uh, entailment. So uh, that's a, a, a really tightly regulated regime. <coughs> so what he, this debate is uh, 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 remarkable at is that it privileges contradictions. It does not privilege truth, but it privileges really contradiction which is really different from the Indian style of debate. And that's why some people uh, are, are diffident of debate, because in a way debate is an exercise in cleverness, right? And the more, the, the more clever person will uh, win. That's why uh, in, philo in, I mean, in Plato there is a certain mistrust of debate, right? Because uh, what you want is truth, is not cleverness, right? And Plato opposes the sophist. The, obviously, Aristotle has a different view because he is a bit more confident that having a, a rational conversation will lead to the truth. The Tibetan view is slightly different because what it aims at is contradiction. And that's a really interesting uh, goal because obviously uh, it is happening in a, in a scholastic tradition in which uh, the content of the tradition is handed down. But it, it makes sense. I don't know if this is why Tibetans developed this system. Uh, I maybe you, uh, Leonard know more about that. Uh, it may be that just it happened that they developed that system. I mean, the statement of consequence exists in Indian logic is just not the main tool. It's like a complement to the main logical tool, which is the statement, the probative statement. But the, this idea of finding contradiction obviously works well within the Madhyamika uh, perspective because Madhyamika basically is argue that the ultimate truth is that there is no ultimate truth. So this kind of uh, emphasis on contradiction, in a way, works in harmony with this kind of really peculiar view, which is the Madhyamika view. Now, this is just how debates are practiced by Tibetans. That's how they think about it. That's not necessarily why they you devised this form of debate, but that's definitely how many teachers think about deba debate. They basically think that debate gives you this, uh, shakes you out of this kind of dogmaticism that you think you understand things, and then shows you that actually everything, even what seems to be the, the most true statement, can be taken apart by people who are uh, clever enough. And that's a great exercise, first obviously in intellectual uh, humility, because one of the great skills that you learn when you are the defendant, the poor guy sitting down, is that you better be ready to be shown to be wrong at any point, because if you hold too long to something which is problematic, you're going to be smashed to pieces. And the uh, the, the proudest you are, the more people are going to go after you with a vengeance like. You know, like this happened to me. I was, I was probably the best uh, student in my, uh, I was at the Buddhist school of dialectic and you know, I was pretty proud that I, I, I had done one or two years of debate. And so 
uh, one night I was a poor guy uh, re- defending, and my friend just went after me, I mean, mercilessly. And, and what's difficult is when you are one-on-one, it's relatively, it's easier because you have only one mind pitted against you. But when you have many people, one guy debates, and then the other people have time to think. And when you don't really have to debate, you will find the contradiction really easily. When you're debating, your mind is so busy by trying not to make a fool of yourself, that's a bit harder to see all the possible angles of attack. But when you are many people and most of the people are just sitting around and listening, they immediately see the weak point. And so they come after you relentlessly. And then you get into this situation in which they play with you like my cat plays with mouse, like pushing you on one side, then on the other side, you get to say no, then they make you contradict yourself, you say yes, then they make you contradict yourself, then you say no, and then they say, okay, oh, we thought you were so bright, so what's happening today, and so on. So this is a a great exercise in learning uh, how to be ready to be shown to be wrong at any time. But it's also an exercise in showing the provisional nature and, uh, uh, of, of truth, of knowledge, because uh, a, a statement which seemed to be kind of rock solid in the hands of skilled debaters kind of start to l- disappear, right? And that's what uh, this education is uh, providing. So... Now, obviously, the tradition is sometimes nervous when uh, monks kind of start to push against some of the, uh, you could call them dogma or kind of basic views of the tradition. And it does happen. In Tibet, the most famous example is Gendun Chirbel, who was trained as a Geluk monk and then turned against many points of Geluk doctrine. It happens at a much smaller degree to several people I know, and there is this tension. Uh, and obviously, the tradition is uncomfortable because it recognizes that inquiry should be free, but it also wants people to kind of uh, remain in the tradition, right? And there is this tension. And that's what, uh, how, what the spirit of scholasticism is. You found, uh, uh, I, I'm not a great expert, but I read a little bit about uh, descriptions of the intellectual debates in Paris in the 12th and 13th century. You find the same tension with people really debating and then the ecclesiastic authority coming down on one side or the other and and so on. So uh, this is a tension that runs through, throughout these traditions in as much as they are alive. The last point that I want to make is that there is a real question how this tradition is going to adapt to modernity, and this is what, in a way, Karsten is uh, busy with. That is, the Dalai Lama wants monks to learn science, for example, So there is a question, what's going to happen to this tradition, which is based on this text, but, you know, the modern world is much broader than this text, in a way, and so what do you do to uh, enable this tradition to come to term with uh, the modern world without losing the very strong uh, intellectual training that this tradition provides. Okay, so that's all. And hopefully there are some questions. Uh, The interesting thing is everything is up for grab. Uh, For example, uh, you can mount a debate uh, for the, the, the questioners holding uh, from the point of view of a Hindu, I don't know, a Nyaya or a Sankhya. And then you can go after your opponent, and if your opponent 
uh, lose, you might even make some comment like, as, thank God the Indian Buddhists were not as dumb as you are, because otherwise we will have all become Hindus, right? So uh, that's perfectly fine. So there is in, in what is interesting in this practice of debate is that there is no sacred point. You can go, you can go after anything. Even the defendant uh, can say, "Okay, I'm not going to hold this view. I'm going to hold that view." And please. What do you do? Show me what I'm wrong. And then you, for example, at one point, as a defendant, you can perfectly hold the Nyaya view. And then the guy will say, aren't you a Buddhist? And you will tell him, yeah, please debate me and show me what's wrong. And then if, you, if the defendant wins the debate, the defendant will kind of make joke about, uh, you know, even you're a Buddhist, you're not so smart. That's going to be the question what kind of new content is brought in and how well can it be integrated in the tradition. I think that's a difficult point. I think the freedom of inquiry is there. It's not a problem. Obviously, ultimately, the tradition will try to rein in people. So, for example, uh, if you pass your exam, you're supposed to hold the orthodox position because that's a public statement, right? But in the normal practice, you can hold any position. It's, that's fine. How you broaden the tradition, I think, is, is, is a difficult point, because it is a kind of limited space, right? And how you bring uh, new ideas into that limited space, that's where it gets really tricky. The Madhyamika philosophy would be very good ground to integrate other views because it has this view that ultimately there is nothing that exists, but conventionally we can make distinctions. So, for example, that allows you to understand different point of view, right? And to allow different point of view. So I don't think philosophically there is a problem. I think it's more a kind of technical problem, how you bring these ideas in dialogue with modern ideas, and that's difficult to do well, right? We know that some of the names of the people who were involved in the world, like Chabachuki Senge and so on, but we don't really know where they got this, uh, all these gestures, and we don't know why they choose this particular intellectual tool that they choose. Uh, I don't know. The second question is, uh, is really appropriate. The first question is really pretty broad, so I'm not sure what I will say. But the second question is, yes, what marks the end of the debate, right? So, for example, if the person contradicts one of his basic theses, that marks, in a way, uh, an end of the debate, right? That's a clear contradiction. So you go, tsa, tsa. But, so that's clear, because it's a contradiction, right? So yes, no, that's a clear outcome. Many debates, another clear outcome is like, there is a large group of people, and the questioner unfurls his debate, and that at some point his debate totally breaks down, and he's like stuttering like a moron, and people tell him, okay, sit down, sit down. That's another end, clear end, uh, and that's pretty humiliating, as you can imagine. If you have hundreds of people, you kind of stutter and, uh, and sometimes people help you because that's really hard. And it's actually harder in a way to be the questioner because you have to do really quick thinking to find the contradiction. Uh, you have to be literally quick on your feet, right? So that's another end. Now, many debates don't have a clear end because the uh, questioners, will his debate will not break down. He will be able 
to make some good points, but the defendant will defend pretty well, and so uh, it's not clear who has won the debate. And then you, often what happens is that, like if they are from two different regional houses, the monastery is grouped in regional houses, the people who are on, from the regional house of the defendant will say, oh, the defendant won, and the people who are from the regional house of the debater will say, no, 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 the debater won. But, yeah, it's not clear. So there is no arbiter in this situation. The debate is inconclusive, which is okay, because the point is really an intellectual training, right? A good defendant sit ver sits very calmly and gives only these three answers that I gave you. And that's actually the most effective strategy, because uh, in a way, the more you speak, the more you give... Uh, you open yourself to contradictions, right? So you give this short answer, and then you wait for the person to uh, unfold contradiction. Like, you know, some people say, yes, but this, this has two parts. And skillful debater will say, okay, what are the two parts? And then, then you have two parts, and each of them can be attacked separately. So the good defender... Uh, just sits down very calmly and just gives the three answers and say, please keep going. Sure, I think uh, that, you know, when I, I got totally smashed, I, I went to sleep and then the next morning I kind of opened my door kind of gingerly wondering, is everybody going to laugh at me and so on. And then, you know, everybody was talking about something else. So you, you exactly get over yourself, right? Which I think is a great, uh, is a great education. At the same time, you also learn to, <coughs> to be as strong as possible in making your point, right? So, so I think that's a great, there is a moral, uh, uh, kind of a moral implication or moral training here in uh, helping you to get over yourself intellectually. Now, you know, this goes only so far, because once you get good, uh, you know, your ego gets good at, at <laughs> you know, at just kind of being, you, you don't kind of, you know, you would never, if you are part of this training, you would never be like a certain president who thinks that his inauguration crowd are the biggest and so on. Because that's kind of dumb, right? You learn how to be proud in a kind of smart way, right? And that's, so that moral training gets so far because after that you get good. And then you, you learn how to get really tricky and you put your pride into kind of, uh, you know, not being too proud but being just strong enough to resist, so uh, it's 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 uh, it's an ongoing moral education. But the the people who do well in debate, I mean, the people who are overly proud, uh, don't do very well in debate because it shows too much, and that doesn't work. The people who are really good at debate are the people who are really quite open to be shown to be, to, be, to, to be wrong. And these people learn a lot. And I had a, a, a teacher, a very respected uh, Genpe uh, Gelsen, who was the abbot of Los Seling. And uh, he uh, was supposed to be pretty weak in debate because he would be defeated every time he answered. And then people, when he became Geshe, people thought, ah, oh, this guy is not going to do very well, but actually he did fantastically because he had all the answers. He has seen all the many ways in which you can be shown to be wrong. And so that's how you learn, right? By being shown to be wrong and by being undermined. And then you learn in this way, right? And sometimes it's painful, but uh, you, you kind of learn from that. And, and, uh, when I was at UVA, uh, you know, I was a student, a graduate student, and so 
some of the professors in philosophy would get in screaming matches with me, and some of the students said to the professor, how can you, how can you scream at George, he's the student, you shouldn't scream, you're a professor. And the professor said, look, this guy can take it, uh, no problem, he has a training. Uh, this, is, this is small potato, and it's true. It's true. When you sit, when you learn, you really develop this kind of uh, openness to be wrong, at the same time, ability to pursue, to make your point. And that's, uh, that's kind of the persona which is uh, the tradition seeks to promote, because that makes for good teachers, right? Any more question? So, so is there a right definition of a permanent? Yes, it's that which is momentary. That's the definition. Yeah. Okay, so, so then get into the. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so then you can't define what is moment. Well, uh, this is going to be a struggle to try to. Uh, defend the view that the idea which is that uh, matters and consciousness is uh, is digital right is not continuous that's a basic idea and so that idea uh, does entail some difficulty and so that's but the opposite idea entails difficulties as well right Well, that's, no, because the idea of momentariness is an idea of continuous, the idea of impermanence is an idea of continuous change, right? And the problem is how you grasp, you grasp that tension between uh, change, because ending by itself is not enough, right? What you want to, to think about is how things change. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the problem, right? That's the problem. So the Buddhists have a nominalist view which argues that there is nothing which uh, remains uh, the same, and so it's just a succession of moments and so on. So this is a nominalist view, right? And what makes for the the continuity is basically a conceptual construction, right? Yeah. Yes. The, uh, for example, uh, where it gets really interesting is debate about, uh, which you find in later Indian philosophy about consciousness, about whether momentariness is compatible with consciousness. I think that's some of the most interesting debates concerning this idea of momentariness. Meaning. Well, meaning that uh, uh, to the Hindu argument, which I think is a pretty strong argument, is that without uh, a, a, a kind of stable entity, you can never get the synthesis between past, present, and future that is required for consciousness. And that, I think, is a really strong argument against the Buddhist position. If you think just about material things, I think... Uh, uh, you might be, the Buddhist might be able to get out uh, of the problem. But as far as consciousness, this is a bit more trick, a bit trickier. The, yeah, it's just that in the Tibetan tradition, uh, Dharma Kirti is really, yeah. Yes, other Buddhist tradition have thought about it and from a Madhyamika perspective, you could say that it, you might adopt a diff, I mean, think of it as just one possibility because ultimately nothing is real, right? So momentariness could be one part, continuity could be another way to look at the world, right? But Tibetan Buddhists and actually later Indian Buddhists 
really adopted Dharma Kirti and so tended to go for this. Uh, uh, in fact, you can say that uh, uh, in, in Indian philosophy between the, I don't know, 7th, 8th century to the 12th, 13th century, Buddhist philosophy meant Dharma Kirti. So when Hindus say Bauda Buddhist, they really mean Dharma Kirti because everybody seemed to hold to Dharma Kirti. And even Madhyamika, uh, which should not hold to Dharma Kirti, did hold to Dharma Kirti to a large extent. So, uh, I have had several explanations. I think the best one is Tsar, you finish. If some of the people say Ngotsa, mean, which mean what a shame, you're shameful, but I don't think so. It's, there is no shame in being wrong. It's you're finished. Oh, tsa. <laughs> and you know, you have to bring out all the venom, right? The, the tsa. <laughs> the, the prajna side, the acumen side, is very much present. This is how the whole exercise is understood as a development of the acumen born from uh, studying, think, thinking, meditating, right? So it's mostly study, sorry, and uh, thinking. The upaya doesn't really come into uh, very much. I mean, people talk about compassion and so on, but it's really a wisdom exercise, if I were to put it like this much more than uh, helping sentient beings. Uh, in, in India, this is called Vitanda, right? Which is considered a bad form of debate, an inferior, let's say, form of debate. And, and when you have people who write about debate, like Sakya Pandita, they tend to write about Indian debate rather than Tibetan debate. Which, exactly. Which, which is why I, at several points in my book, I was struggling because I would have liked to have a text <laughs> thinking, this is what these people, did. no, I, you know, I just totally made it up, right? Which is kind of, in a way, cool, you will think, but in a way, you, it's kind of difficult because there is, you can go anywhere. There is no resistance, right? Because you have no material against which to kind of uh, measure your 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 ideas, right? So this is yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. This is really, uh, I, yeah, to understand well the argument. You see, you have to be on both sides of yes and no, and come on the right side, right? That's what it's really tricky because if you just repeat the the text, then you you know you're like a parrot that provides you no understanding. So you really have to con understand the complexity of the doctrine and yet come at on the right side of things what Dharma Kirti tells you. Now, actually, it's it's tricky because many points of Dharma Kirti actually I would argue contradict Madhyamika. So this is a really tricky gymnastic in which the, the, the end result is unstable, right? But there are certain basic points that you will always keep, like impermanence means momentariness and so on. D different teachers, uh, first, what teachers tell you as a matter of... Uh, as an advice, is don't come to uh, hasty the conclusion. There is a Tibetan proverb which is, don't under-investigate, don't over-decide. Basically, what they will tell you is all these difficult points, don't rush to conclusion. And you just hold this, what these texts say, but don't necessarily believe them, don't decide what uh, is true and not true, what you are doing is investigating. And then gradually you will form a view, but don't think that the exercise is about uh, uh, getting to the truth. 
I, in a way, I, I, I think very much like Gadamer, that is, to understand something is to understand what is questionable. To understand a statement is to understand what is questionable in that statement, right? I think that, now, not all teachers agree with that. Some of my teachers very much wanted me to follow their views. And I remember one of my teachers, I tried, to, at some point, I tried to debate. I raised a debate with him and he said, Am I not your teacher? It's like, Okay, sorry. <laughs> and then another teacher uh, would say, What's your debate today? And uh, I would say, Sorry, I don't have debate. Okay, then come back when you have a debate. And so uh, a third teacher will tell me, uh, what's your question after teaching? And I would say, oh, you know, I don't have a question. I think I understand pretty well. And he would say, well, there are two people who have no question. The completely enlightened Buddha has no question, and the complete moron has no question either. Uh, which one are you? <laughs> so you see, different teachers have a different take. Some teacher very much emphasize the truth comes from the tradition, and I will tell you what is true, and you better hold to that view. Other teachers will say, no, not at all. Uh, we are not here to decide what's true and not true. This will happen very slowly and gradually. What we are here is to really raise questions. And no need to say I prefer the second one, but I had several different teachers. And they, they had a very different opinion on that. Uh, I do think that there is a, a kind of uh, fortunate uh, encounter between the form of debate and Nagarjuna's philosophy. And maybe it's an accident, maybe not. But it's clear that the kind of attitude that, you know, we are not here to decide what's true or not. We are here to raise doubts and to raise questions is very much in the spirit of Madhyamika, right? So that's where I guess I would go. Uh, the, the, the Vipassana and so on, not so much because Tibetan, when they practice, they really uh, do Lamrim and then they do Tantra, right? Yeah. And then it goes into a completely different direction. <laughs> what is interesting is that, I mean, this is a big difference between Geluk and other schools, is that Geluk really emphasized understanding Buddhism from the sutra point of view, and yet the main practice is tantric. Whereas in the Nyingma, you have, a, uh, you have in a way, from the start, you think about, Buddhist from a tantric perspective. The practice is actually pretty similar. I mean, Leonard might disagree with me, but they are roughly the same, right? So the Geluk, what is strange is they understand the Tantra from a Sutra perspective, so they will point to all these practices and so on, but actually what they practice is really Tantra when they're done with Lamrim, right? Historically, I mean, this all comes from Buddhist modernism, right? Uh, which historically it's the encounter of Buddhism and modernity and the fact that Buddhism was under attack by missionaries and then Buddhists realized that, you know, these people believe in this strange idea of a god and we don't, so we might actually be more scientific than they are. So this was the start of the use by Buddhists of... Uh, of, of uh, 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 science. Now, uh, how Buddhists do it, I think it varies. Now, as far as Tibetans is, are concerned, uh, you, what you have to realize is that the Tibetan encounter with modernity is much more recent than other Buddhist traditions. In Theravada tradition, for example, they had about, uh, what, 150, almost 200 years encounter, right? So when you read people like Buddha Dasa, you see a view which is already well digested and which is, still I have problem with Buddha Dasa formulation, but you can see that 
in a way, he has given up more metaphysics already uh, and is pretty close to finding a version of Buddhism that a, mater- uh, a scientific view would be comfortable with. I think the Tibetans are not as far. Uh, the encounter with modernity is very recent. It's also very traumatic. And uh, I don't know what they're going to do. For me, I am very dissatisfied by uh, some of the the ideas that... I mean, I asked some of the people at the science center, and, and they seem to build slowly to build their own version of a Buddhist answer, which would, would be something like a multiple world or something like that. So I think they're aware of the problem, and I think uh, I'm not sure that uh, the Dalai Lama's formulation are going to uh, withstand the encou- a sustained encounter with modernity, right? Because, uh, yeah. And so where this is going. Now, my own answer would be that if you took a Madhyamika, strict Madhyamika perspective, actually you could build a very consistent Buddhism which would be entirely in agreement with Madhyamika and would be, and would present no metaphysical challenge whatsoever. But obviously, uh, you would give up a number, you would have to give up a number of things such as, uh, rebirth which is a huge thing from a traditional Buddhist perspective, right? So that's, yeah, I think your perception is is mine as well, and uh, that's why I've been wondering, what are they really trying to do in this Buddhist science encounter and educating the monks? Uh, I, I was impressed by the fact that they really do something, uh, and so, but I have no idea where this is going. I have no idea. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sound of two hands clapping, right?